Welcome to the Orchard Podcast. Uh, we are on episode four in our third series, and we're exploring the women of the story. Uh, episode four, about halfway through the series, and so we sort of feel like we found our groove now. <laughs> And we're going to be looking at Esther, but actually not just Esther. We titled this Esther and Queen Vashti because we love, actually we've, we've sort of fallen in love with a little cameo that Queen Vashti plays. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So quick synopsis of Esther, the book of Esther, uh, if you know your Bible, we, we were thinking, we think Esther is the only book in the yeah. Bible named after a woman. It actually is. I think it is. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, all 10 chapters of it. And <laughs> Esther is about halfway through the Old Testament, if you're trying to find it Ruth. just before Nehemiah. Oh, there's Ruth. Oh, no. <laughs> we literally did lose <laughs> Ruth last week. Good. Do you know, I can imagine people listening, thinking, going no, like, literally shouting, Ruth, Ruth. Ruth. <laughs> Sorry, Ruth. We forgot about you just for a moment. Okay, one of the very few books of the Bible named after a woman. So Esther is set in the Persian Empire, and it's the biggest empire in the whole world at that time. Uh, It's about 500 500 BC before Christ. And um, the king of the Persian Empire is a guy called Xerxes. He's married to Queen Vashti. And as we pick up the story there is this big party that's been thrown at the palace. And it's not just a like, come for drinks at seven, go home at midnight. It's Mm -hmm. like a big party, seven day party. Um, He's invited all his male friends from all over the place. And it's like a booze fest, basically. Mm -hmm. That's what you, that's what you gather from the story. They're all just there to get completely hammered for a few days. And at some point um, within the proceedings, the king inebriated wants his wife to come. He wants uh, Queen Vashti to come and be paraded amongst his drunk friends. Uh, And so he he, um, calls for the servant to go and get Vashti and the servant goes and Vashti says, no, I'm I'm not going to come. And and even though it's not explicit, there's an, it's inferred that she doesn't want to come because she doesn't want to be paraded around in front of his drunk friends. We can assume Uh, uh, And so the king is not happy about this. It says he burns with anger and he decides to sack Queen Vashti and get a new queen. And so they come up with this plan to hold this year-long beauty contest. They basically search the land for all the most beautiful women and they, I was going to say invite them to the palace, but the sense that we get is it's slightly more uh, sort of a non-negotiable than that. (laughs) They're dragged to the palace perhaps, who knows? Mm. And, uh, And they're all partake in this year-long beauty contest and at the end of which Esther is one of those Esther is one of those selected and we discover that Esther is this orphan she's a Jewish refugee Mm. she's being raised by her cousin in fact she's been adopted that's what it says by her cousin Mordecai he features quite significantly in the story and we know that Esther is like breathtakingly beautiful and so she's kind of plucked out of her life of obscurity and landed in the center of everything in the palace And it says that Esther wins favor with everyone that she sees at the palace. So there's clearly Mm. like a, Mm. there's something about this Mm. woman that's more than just her good looks. You know, she's, Mm. she's clearly a leader. There's leadership on her. There's influence on her. And King Xerxes uh, meets Esther and he's smitten. She's the winner. She becomes the next queen. Meanwhile, Mordecai uh, is kind of hanging outside the palace. He overhears about this assassination plot against the king. Uh, He tells Esther, Esther tells the king, and they uncover this plot. And Mordecai is the hero of the moment for saving the king's life. There's also this other guy called Haman. Haman's like the baddie in the story. This is like a Shakespearean yeah, play, isn't it? Really it is. Basically, <laughs> Haman is the baddie in the story, but he's also found favor with the king. The king's elevated Haman, um, but Mordecai won't bow down to Haman. And Haman is an arrogant, vain man, and he doesn't like this one bit. Uh, and so he kind of takes drastic action and plans for this, uh, the annihilation of the whole of the Jewish people. And he, see, he seems to sort of get this past the king, this plan to basically slaughter the entire Jewish population. Mordecai also hears about this plan and is utterly devastated as a Jew himself. Mm. Esther, at the moment, her identity as a Jew is concealed within the palace, so nobody knows. And so Mordecai recognizes that the only hope that the Jewish people have is through Esther, And there's that famous line that comes in chapter four that says, Mordecai says to Esther, could it be that Mm. you've come to your royal position for such a time as this? Mm. Could it be 
that God, in fact, God isn't mentioned by name at all in the book of Esther, but that again, there's an inference that God has set this up so that Esther is in the palace at that time yeah. to save the Jewish people. But we'll, we'll learn it's not just the Jewish people that she's saving at that time. Anyway, uh, and so Esther risks her life to stand before the king, the most powerful man, pretty much in the planet, on the mm. planet at mm. that time. Mm. And she also invites Haman at the same time. And so she exp- exposes Haman's plot to kill the Jews in front of Haman. All while Mordecai is kind of fresh in the king's mind because he's just remembered mm-hmm. about the way that Mordecai saved his life. And so anyway, Haman ends up being hung on the gallows that Haman himself had set up for Mm -hmm. Mordecai. Mm -hmm. And so the Jewish people are saved. Yes. There we go. That is the end of Mm. the story. (laughs) So good. Um, Before we even go in, though, you you picked up on Queen Vashti. Mm -hmm. Um, And as we were reading this and chatting about it, she, I just really feel like she was highlighted to us yeah you know and how many times you read the story yeah and you sort of just read chapter one and you're like oh okay okay so Esther you know and obviously Esther's amazing and we're going to speak about her but actually if you think about Queen Vashti you know she um how courageous Mm. you know that ultimately she like you said um she was asked to come and parade and sort of be um a bit of a a picture on the wall like objectified basically for these and it says they were high they were high in spirits. It was like day five or something um, of their party. Can you remember five, you remember five day party? I, I just would not have the stamina. <laughs> I can tell you that. I'd be asleep on the sofa by 9 p.m. You would. I would. <laughs> good job. It's a good job. I wasn't there. Oh, that's so good. Oh, but anyway, so they're all really drunk. <laughs> and uh, and she says no. And because she's she says no, obviously he gets really annoyed and and sort of you know, pushes her out ultimately. But it's so interesting when you actually read the chapter that the amount of sort of fear that's created because of her no, it was like, oh, we need to do something about it because, you know, what's this going to mean for all the other women in their households? And they're going to start saying no to men. And, you know, oh, we need to bring order back. It's like this panic. Quick, lock them up again. It yeah. is, isn't it? it um, and even um, even at the end of the chapter, um, it says that, you know, it's going to, this script is going to go out to all the, you know, all the people saying, Saying that um, it says that should uh, every man should be ruler over his household, you know, using every, using their native tongue. Um, just this idea of um, yeah, fear ruling their behaviour. It's a fear but, reaction, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and interesting because the a women's that that you know even reading into it a little bit, but the liberation of a woman or the um, yeah it. It's it they it they can feel the danger like mm. do you know what I mean they mm. and it reminds me of Satan's curse in Genesis three you know where the the curse over a woman is that um that that they they will be ruled over man they'll be ruled over their husband mm. um and it's that same like. I think we freak the enemy out, basically. When we're let loose. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's like, I think that when we get our voice and when we say no to power or whatever it is, it's like, ah, I'm frightened. Yeah. Let's lock them up. Quick. Let's lock them up. Yeah. Um, and I think that was highlighted to us because what we see in the rest of the book mm. is God using a woman, a, a, a powerless woman who is a refugee, no family line, you know, using this woman to come and liberate his people. Mm, I mean, mm. it's unbelievable. Mm. And what we read in this is the enemy hates women, but God loves women. And uses women in his story in powerful as a key, ways. key role. Ugh. And it's interesting what Vashti is saying no to. What yeah. she's saying no to is no to exploitation. Yeah. She's saying no to objectification. Isn't she? She's not so, like being mean, is she? Yeah, she's not no. Like doing anything well, exactly. Particularly. She's literally saying, "No, yeah. I'm, I'm exactly. not going to. I'm not going to relinquish my dignity." Isn't that amazing? I know. It is and amazing. I think even that the, the again, the enemy hates it when women say, yeah. I, "I'm getting oh, the shivers." I actually, am too. I think it was. I, I will yeah. not relinquish my dignity. Yes. And you know, I think dignity is one of those things that. I know for me, my story is there was a point, and I've shared some of this before. I made some really p- poor decisions around 
my sexuality essentially sort of the way that I just sort of casually engaged in in sex essentially mm. and it, it did feel like I just threw away my dignity yeah. and I do think mm. that there's something that terrifies the enemy when a woman says no yeah I'm gonna hold on to my dignity I'm saying no yeah I'm saying no to objectification I'm saying no to being used and abused I'm mm. saying no to being exploited isn't that amazing it Go is. Queen Vashti. I know. Uh, sorry, that I was, know. That was Queen not, Vashti. Like, that was a rally girl But moment, also, also, you know, girl. and then we'll move on to Esther. <laughs> but, but also her courage sets up Esther. Yes. You know, so actually there are two heroes in the story. Mm-hmm. Rashti to say, not no. Not Rashti. <laughs> Rashti, I said that earlier, didn't I? Vashti. Uh, <laughs> um... You know, for, you know, saying no ultimately sets up Esther to come. And you know what's interesting is they're set up as rivals. Yeah. So that's the other thing is that's the other way the enemy works, isn't it? That they're, you know, essentially Esther is Vashti's replacement. Yeah. They're set up as rivals and yet actually Esther builds on... Yeah, builds on Vashti's kind of holy defiance. Oh, Do you know it. what I mean? Yeah. And actually, because defi- essentially she is being defiant. Yes, yes. But there's a holiness to her defiance, isn't yeah. it? And again, we talked about dignity. There's a dignity to her defiance. Yeah. And, it, and we've said this, it, te- it terrifies ultimately the enemy. Yes. It terrifies absolutely. the enemy. Yes. And the end, that's played out yeah, through the response what, yeah. of the men. I hope that was clear. Yes. Yeah, no, exactly. It's not about all men. It's, <laughs> no. it's about the way that the enemy's exactly. plan to suppress and contain yeah. women yeah. plays out through fear and exactly. misogyny, exactly. you know, and oppression, essentially. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh. So, woo, woo, we could woo. just stop there, couldn't we? <laughs> but Esther, we've got to move on to Esther. And really, there's two things that we want to say about Esther. And, and that is that Esther has, has been positioned, like there is a, mm. a positioning that goes on for Esther in her life, but also she's got a commission. She has a job to, so she, she, we find Esther, she's put in a particular place, a very positioned in a very particular place, and she's given a very particular job to do. And I think that's what we recognize God doing in our lives. And and we sense that's what God is wanting to do in all of our lives, Mm -hmm. that he wants to, to give us a very specific position uh, to place us in a particular environment, context, yeah. life stage, whatever it might be, and then to give us a specific job to do within it. Mm. And the challenge here is that not all of us love <laughs> the position yeah. that we've been put in. Yeah. You know, whether that, again, whether that is geography, it could be like a particular place, yeah. it could be um, your marital status, maybe you're single and you don't want to be, maybe you're married and you don't want to be, you know, maybe you're in an unhappy marriage or whatever, again caveat there if you're an abusive marriage then seek help please Mm. speak up yeah but that positioning might also be about life stage you know maybe you're in a life stage that doesn't feel comfortable or has limitations on it for whatever reason but I guess the message that we want to say is that wherever God has positioned you again caveat unless that's a place where Mm, you're uh, there's abuse and danger etc God can use where you've been positioned. Mm. And that actually sometimes we can find ourselves struggling with where we've been positioned because it's tough. Yeah. Maybe it's boring. Yeah. Maybe it feels unfulfilling. Maybe it's uncomfortable in, in a kind of a, you know, mm-hmm. comfort zone sense. But ultimately Esther, Esther's story tells us that there is significant, it's not insignificant, it's not inconsequential where God has placed you, even if it's not sort of a place of like endless joy and thriving or whatever, what's the challenge there? And I, you know, I was thinking about, I was thinking about when Tim and I felt called to move to Birmingham, Mm. actually we thought we were going to stay in London and London's an amazing place to live. And at that point we weren't particularly enamored with Birmingham um and it's a bit north please. a bit, bit north <laughs> actually I am like I know, Birmingham's love. biggest fan yes. but we had taken a break to Australia we'd used a sort of gap between leaving London and going to Birmingham to to visit our brother who lives in Australia hello Johnny he does sometimes listen to this doesn't he <laughs> if you're listening and so we're in Australia and I remember I'd gone for a run in Sydney I was running along the beach and one of 
uh, one of Sydney's are most beautiful. I mean, and like it was beautiful. The sun was out. Mm. And uh, we're both big fans of the sunshine and feeling warm. And I remember standing on that beach in Sydney and thinking, we could come here. <laughs> Like, I'm sure we could come to Sydney and plant a church. I am sure Sydney is crying out for us to plant a church. And then I could just do this like every morning. And at that moment, just for a moment, Sydney just seemed like, humanly speaking, way more appealing than Birmingham, UK. And then I was just reminded, I can vividly remember, I just remember the Holy Spirit saying, but I've called you to Birmingham. Yeah. I have a plan for you in Birmingham. I've commissioned you to be in Birmingham. Mm. And I had this overwhelming sense of, do you know what? This is great, but I don't want to be anywhere else in the world. Mm. I want to be right at the center of what God is doing. And if that is Birmingham, I'm there. <laughs> and now, of course, I love it. Yeah. Uh, and so I guess the key is that where we've been positioned mm is significant i was even thinking about that that um that it's uh, i guess it brings me a lot of pur- it brings me a lot of hope and purpose for where you're at because it could be that yes it's a job or a season or mm-hmm. something like that, but also your street or yeah. where you live um or the people that you're at school with or the people that you're at university with or the people that you work with mm. um that actually there's a um like act- to to think do you know god has placed me in this workplace has put me in this on this street next to these neighbors for a reason yeah and that actually you can begin to ask god okay what is it how do you want to use me on my street how Absolutely. can i pray for the people around me in my work or whatever mm. um this it's somehow it's a bit it's adventure isn't it to be like okay here i am I'm what's like, the plan what's the plan yeah how do you want to use me in this place yes um is it uh, feels quite exciting and you know I think for Esther, it's probably a big surprise to her that she ends up in the palace. Like that was not her plan. I think it's it's important to remember that as we think about our own lives that, you know, Esther didn't have an ambition. Her her life's goal was not to sort of get a job in the palace. And it's like, yes, I've finally arrived. Now, God, you can use me. I think she's probably as surprised as everyone else (laughs) that she's, you know, come to royal position for such a time as this. And I think the important thing to hold on, the thing that encourages me when I look at the story of Esther is what we see is that Esther is actually in two two stories. There's the, like the micro story of her life, all yeah. the twists and turns, the Shakespearean plots. Yeah. But then you kind of zoom out. And of course, we've got the luxury of recognizing that she is part of a much, much like a macro story, mm-hmm. like a much, mm-hmm. much bigger story. And what we realize is that what's at stake in like the big story is the ancestral line of the Messiah. Mm. It's not just even about the genocide of a particular people group, even though that's obviously terrible. Mm. But even more than that, even more, Esther has come to her royal position for such a time. It's not just to save the Jewish people that were there at that time, but to ultimately save the ancestral line of the messiah so like she is she has no idea yeah she has no idea that she she's there in the palace Mm. wasn't her plan Mm. and yet she Mm. she chooses to be obedient actually more than that she chooses to risk her life yeah and it's for this it's for the sake of a much bigger story and that should be an encouragement to us that um that the micro details of our every late day lives might not feel very important might not feel very significant but we have to trust, even when it's hard going, even when it's really mundane, we have to trust that we are part of actually a much, much bigger story. Mm, yeah. You know, this macro story. Yeah. And then actually, I think even what we were saying last week is, or last time that we were doing this, um, is that obedience is, doesn't, is not knowing the end of the story. Absolutely. But to trust that actually when we're following God's will, when we're saying yes to him, that he is... He is writing a bigger story. Um, and this is like perfect illustration, isn't yeah. it? Amy, question for you. What, <laughs> yes. what season in your life would you say you struggled most to sort of really identify God being at work? Like almost you've had to really choose to believe that God was at work, even though mm. what you were walking through felt like oh, is this what I'm meant to be doing or is this where I'm meant to be? Yeah. I put you on the spot actually there. Yeah. Um, I definitely, 
I definitely, there was a hard season, like very hard season in when I lived in America, actually. Okay. Um, although it was amazing, wonderful people. Suffering for the gospel know, in California. In California. Yeah. But it felt like um, two years before that, I had recently become a Christian and had like, you know, I feel like God had been sort of, you know, showing up in spectacular ways and doing lots of healing and speaking to me. And then I went to California and it went silent. I couldn't hear him. Um, and I didn't know that. Yeah, and felt like a real kind of... Um, it just felt like a very, very dry patch, having just had like two years of extravagant God at work mm. in my life. And actually, what's really hilarious, Rachel, is that the day before... I left to go to California. I said to a friend in the church that I was at, I said, do you know, I just, I just feel, I just feel totally like sorted. <laughs> I feel like totally okay. You know, I feel like I know the father's love and I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm just ready. And then go to California and it's like, oh, wow. I didn't know the formation that needed to happen on a much, much deeper level. Wow. Um, and so although it was hard and when I was in it, I'm like, why am I here? This is, what's going on? I, you know, where, where are the friends that I used to have? And you know, nothing made sense. Mm. I can now obviously look back and he did the, probably the deepest work in the driest season. Yeah. What about you? Um, I think, funny enough, I think it was when the kids were really little. And I say that hesitantly because I love my kids. I have five of them. So I do like children. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have chosen to have five. But I, I found that season of motherhood. I might have spoken about this before, so mm. forgive me if you're listening to this and you've heard me say this before. But I don't know that we can say this too much. Yeah. Because actually that season, particularly when kids are little, and, and we both made the choice to be at home mm. uh, until our youngest was sort of, you know old enough to go to nursery at like two three and and we had our first four children in really quick succession so it was like seven years of being mm. basically at home raising babies and it like you were saying at the time it felt like quite a desolate season spiritually yeah I found it really mundane yeah I'm not I'm a massive extrovert I love adventure I love new things. I love the sort of the camaraderie of being in an office, you know, with a team, working with a team. And I also re realized that my sense of identity was intrinsically yeah. linked to what I did. Yeah. And because we live in a society that, quite frankly, does not place value or isn't, you know, you, you go to a dinner party and somebody says to you, what do you do? And you say, oh, I actually stay at home with my children. You see the sort of glazed overlook. Like there, there isn't this sort of collective value or interest yeah. in mothers or fathers who choose to stay at home with young children and I felt really aware of that so it was kind of a stripping season yeah. it was a mundane season but it was also exhausting <laughs> took me to like the very limits of myself yeah. mm. but like you I look back mm. I don't regret it for a second yeah. on so many levels to be honest yeah. but one of the things I don't regret is that it, it felt like a a death to self season. I know that yeah. sounds a bit dramatic. And yeah. again, women have been doing this for centuries. Yeah. It's not new. I didn't do anything particularly heroic. Mm. But um, that, that sort of death to self, mm. I think, has set me up mm. for so much of what's happened since then. That, that, you know what, that, you know, like Paul talks about, I'm content in, in all, all I wouldn't, I, yeah. I wouldn't sort of put myself at Paul's level. I haven't been imprisoned or flogged or anything like that. <laughs> I've just hung out with small children for a long time. But, <laughs> but I also think, you know what, I'm good. I'm good with the mundane. I can, I'm good with obscurity. Yeah. I, I know what it's like to just think, okay, let's mm. just get through today. Yeah. And I think that's really important. It's really edifying. So again, if you're in that season, yeah. you're listening to this, be yeah. encouraged. God is at work. If we'll let him, yeah. if we'll let him, yeah. God is at work in the, the micro. Mm. And they're all seasons, aren't they, that um, oh, enable you to serve him only. Yes. And when, I guess, when you sort of get closer and we're all on a journey to sort of, I guess, taking hold of that. Mm. I think once you, when you take hold of that more and more, you become just... I think slippery to the enemy oh, and, like you know, and fiery for God. You know, it's like, oh, I'm serving you only, Lord. I'll do whatever you want mm -hmm. me to do, regardless of whether recognition comes or not. Uh, because it certainly doesn't when you're 
with little ones every day. No, so. no one's giving me an appraisal. I know. <laughs> Where's my appraisal? I know, today? I'd wait for Friday, you know, for that knock at the door. And there'd be this government official, you know, that would say, Rachel, we've been reviewing the CCTV that we set up in your kitchen and you've done really, really well. Just, you know, the way that you negotiated with that two-year-old, the way you made that organic dinner for your the children. The Play-Doh model. The Play-Doh model. The, the, just the way you showed up yeah. today. The way you got up in the night, the way you changed that stinky nappy, which you 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 get the prize this week. Like that never happened. Did it happen to you? No. no from you, be. maybe. From you. Yes. 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 That's all we've got to do it for each other. That's yes. true, actually. So we learned that Esther is c- positioned, that, that that place, placing, where we're placed is significant. But she also has a job to do. God commissions, and she's not like just thrown into the palace for yeah. no reason. There is a specific role, task that she has to do. And I guess. That's the second thing that's an encouragement to us is that wherever God has placed us for a particular season, and season is so important to recognize because if you think that the season that you're in is going to last forever, you have a very different view on it. But if you know that life is sort of, Mm. the seasons of life could change at any moment, then I think sometimes it's easier to embrace the season that you're in, you know, knowing that it won't last forever. Yeah. But uh, she has this commission. There's this commission on her life. I love it. It says, I don't know where it is, but it says, um, Esther puts on her royal I robes. Know, Actually, you spotted that, didn't you? And it's this sense of authority. It's this sense of, okay, I'm in. I'm, in. I'm getting ready for the task. I'm mm-hmm. putting on my uniform. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like, okay, are we going to put on our royal robes mm-hmm. and say, Lord, I'm here. You've mm-hmm. placed me here in Mm. this life stage, in this city, in this town, Mm. in this whatever neighborhood, I'm putting on my royal robes and I'm going to step into the commission that you've placed on me. And And our robes are the authority of Jesus. Yes. Robes of the spirit. (laughs) Robes of the spirit. (laughs) That sounds like a really (laughs) weird sort of ministry or something. (laughs) Like a Christian clothing line. I love it. Somebody might actually, sorry if you actually do run a business called Robes of the Spirit. Um, God bless you. Um, but I, th- I think when we think about this, there are barriers, aren't there? Because the challenge is for many of us, and I think there is something around mm. us women that's specific here, that there can be barriers to us stepping in to God's call. And, and very quickly, I think two of those might be fear of failure being one yeah and maybe comparison being another that actually maybe god has put us in a place maybe we know what god's calling us to do but we kind of back out Mm. because we're so scared we're going to fail or we sort of get started and then and then we see that somebody else we we scroll through social media it's like oh but they're doing it so much better than me and then we just shrink back how do we what's the answer ames (laughs) what's the solution well i think the answer is i mean don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Run away. No. Yeah. Um, well, I think she says, doesn't she, in Esther, um, if I perish, I perish. Oh, and I think ultimately to break fear is to know that this life isn't the end. And I think fear is obviously we're the, you know, fear of failure and comparison is ultimately fear, isn't it, that we're not good enough or we're not enough. And so actually to, I don't know, to combat fear, I guess is to say, I'm yours no matter what, um, because I know that this isn't the end. If I perish, I perish here, but I'll be with you for eternity. So I think there is a perspective. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's really lofty and, um, you know, perhaps you don't walk around thinking that all day. But <laughs> No, I, I do, yeah. actually. But I think that there is a, I guess, the sort of not trying to sort of preserve yourself or mm-hmm. preserve what others think of you in this life do you know what I mean mm. there, is, there is a perspective in that that mm. is like Lord help me not care about whether I die or not today you know yeah. in all the, you know what I mean what I'm yes. trying to say here yeah um, for the sake of your kingdom because this isn't the end um, yeah it's that perspective isn't it it's a, a heavenly perspective that sort of informs mm. the choices that we make in the day to day yeah and yeah. I, I think the hard thing is these things are powerful aren't they the fear of failure yeah, and comparison or perfectionism and failure and comparison, these are powerful voices. Yeah. And actually, maybe for some people listening, and I, I think this has been true for us, to silence those voices that say, 
don't do it. You're going to mess it up, yeah. you know, or to silence the voice that says, you're just, you're just not as good as everybody mm. else, so don't mm. bother. Actually, that requires some deep work. Yeah. And maybe the encouragement for some, some yeah. people listening is, mm. do the deep work. Yeah. You know, go, go and get counselling, go and get therapy, mm. you know, whatever think, it's going to take yeah. to understand where the roots are coming from. And I think it's recognising the voices, isn't it, to start yes, with? So maybe true. for you it's, um, or for whoever's listening, that actually it's observing your thought life yeah. and writing down, you know, oh gosh, do you know, I think these brutal th- thoughts about me or these condemning thoughts about me mm-hmm. all day long. Mm-hmm. And it's become a bit like bread and butter. You don't even think about it. Um, and actually it's a, maybe writing them down to realise, oh yeah, I'm, these are these are sort of bombarding my mind. What can I replace these thoughts with? That kind mm. of thing, I guess. And actually there's there's also, I guess, an invitation to think about where we're placing our worship. Like yeah. it, it, I'm thinking about idolatry. I know that's a bit of a, it's a funny word now, isn't it? But yeah. it's, so, it's so important mm. that we grasp the concept. Yeah. Because often our fears are yeah. related to what is on the throne of our lives. Yeah. Our loves. Yeah. Our loves. And mm. so... I know for me, when I'm afraid of failure, often it's connected to the idolatry of success. Yeah. That, that to silence, to get free, is to say, God, today, I just tear down yeah. the idolatry of success. Mm. That actually, when, when, when success isn't sort of um, a driving force, and, and I mean success in terms of the the way that the va- the world values it when when that isn't kind of a metric that we're measuring our lives by it kind of loses its power and then failing actually isn't a problem <laughs> of or, or, or fear of failure isn't a problem because it's like well I'm I'm not mm. I'm not measuring my life by those metrics anymore I'm mm. measuring my life by what does what does God think what does Jesus say yeah. that's that's freedom ultimately yeah. isn't yeah. it absolutely and even going back to Esther, you know, what's interesting... Oh, yeah, Esther. <laughs> no, but what is interesting about Esther is that, like you said, you know, she didn't force her way into the palace, did she? Um, and we don't know her sort of, um, her personal prayer life, but I imagine it was pretty deep, um, yeah. her devotion. Um, and actually, I remember... Well, song, she fasts, doesn't she? That's her first oh, response. Go, it's pretty, like, it's right, we're all going to fast. Pretty devoted then. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's leading the people to fast, isn't yeah. she? Yeah. Um, and so actually, I think that in some ways, don't push yourself forward, basically. It's interesting. I think, I think devote yourself to, uh, you know, I guess the, the challenge I challenge myself and for us is actually just let devotion be the your driver. legacy. Let it be mm. your driver. Let it be the thing that you put all your energy in. How do mm. I love you more, Jesus? How can I serve you more? And actually allow him to raise you up in whatever that looks like and however that looks. And so when the comparisons and the failures come, it can be like, do you know what? You've placed me here. Uh, you've placed me here, Lord. You give me the ability. Mm. I'm, I'm going to rely on your strength. I'm going to mm. depend upon you because you've put me here. Yeah. There's no other way that mm. this is possible. Does that yeah, make sense? It does. And that's what we see with Esther, basically. And maybe just to end with this, one of the other things I love about the story of Esther is there's this bit where Mordecai says, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But who knows that you've come to your opposition for such a time as this. And what I hear in that is like Mordecai saying, you know what, Esther, you've got a choice. And this is the thing, isn't it? When God says, Rach, Amy, or whoever's listening, here's what I want you to do. I want you to step out in this or step out in that. And ultimately, God's saying, look, like, like Mordecai to Esther, He's going to do it anyway. Like, that's the macro. Like, Jesus is on the throne. Yeah. There will be a day yeah. when every knee will bow, yeah. every tongue will confess. Like, that day is coming. It's set in stone. It's coming. It's happening. Yeah. And so the question is, do you, do you want to be part of that? 
do you want to step into it? Like he's going to do it anyway. Yeah. He's going to do it. Deliverance and relief. It's going to come from somewhere else. If you don't choose to step into the story, Esther, it's going to happen anyway because God is God and he's going to do what he's going to do. The trajectory is set, mm. but you could be part of it. Mm. And again, I think it's so tragic when I, I see women step out of the adventure, step out of the story because they're so scared of messing yeah. it up. Yeah. They're so afraid. They, they feel so bound. They're so crushed by these glass ceilings so held back yeah. and actually the invitation yeah. is God's doing it God's on the move God's story is being written and has been written there's an invitation mm. step in mm. like shake off yes. the fear shake off the comparison yeah. step out of the boats yeah. I'm mixing up my bible stories here <laughs> but just do yeah. it like do it yeah and be part of what God is doing because there is no greater adventure is yeah. there there is no greater adventure and I think with that is the stepping in is is the prayer saying, Lord, I am yours. Use me as you like. Because the outworking, like we said a few points back, it might not be it might not be wonderful. Might not be big and glamorous. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it's it's saying, okay, I am giving you my life. Yeah. I am yours no matter what. Just pray that every Un- day. Like an unconditional yes. And yeah. you're in the adventure. And you don't know whether it's a micro or a macro. You don't know the big story, the small story. Yeah. It's like over to you, Lord. You 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 write it. Love that. Yeah. Amen. Do you want to pray? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, Holy Spirit, we thank you. Um we just thank you for this time together. And we thank you for um Esther and everything that we've learned even um about you right now. And I pray for everyone listening, um, everyone who is um hearing this. I pray now, Holy Spirit, would you fill them? I pray, Lord, for tangible um, moment encounters with you right this moment, that there would be, um, I pray that you'd bring peace to the frantic heart, to the anxious mind. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, pour out your peace now, that you would come and rest and bring reassurance that you are working in every situation, that you bring good out of everything. And so we pray, Lord, that you would um, continue to do a deep work um, in your world and in your people. And I pray, Lord, for every woman that you would um, give them the courage this day to step into all you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.